Well again folks, um, today we're going to be covering uh, the solutions to test number one, which covers chapter one, part of chapter six and the very first section of chapter 10. All right. What you should have received is a link or rather a PDF that if you print it uh, produces this. This is a physical copy of test number one. All right. Uh, again, you don't have to submit anything. I'm going to give it to you as a, basically a freebie, all right, because I'm, I keep trying to tell you, I, I'm more interested in you doing your homework, all right, because your homework counts for 50% of your grade. So since your assignments are for these chapters uh, due later this evening, I would want you primarily to focus on that. Nonetheless, I'm going over this because it's a summary, all right, for your own sake, Right, of the material from those respective chapters and sections, right, so that uh, you have a good review. Right? Uh, in theory, you're going to be taking this class to prepare for your praxis examination. So keep this, please, all right? And when you have the moment after you're done finishing your homework, which is where your experience primarily comes from, uh, you can go over the solutions here, all right? I'll have, they'll be discussed here. So do try to print that if you're following along, all right, and I'll get started. Right. Let me put that aside. Today is Tuesday, February 9th, and we are on schedule. It's a very, very, right. my face needs to catch up with my caffeine. I feel droopy. Um, anyhow, uh, I promise not to fall apart here. <laughs> Let me turn on my projector and I'll sort of write on top of the uh, PDF. And I'll adjust the lights too. Let's see. Down the curtain. I'm gonna make it too dark. Make it spooky. Mm -hmm. It's thinking. Oh, I didn't connect it. Ding dong, always forgets to plug in the extra wire. Yeah, there you go. Come on. Yep, there we are. <clears throat> I had um, someone send me a message today. They say, hey, you know, you, you sent us an email, uh, but it didn't have any links in it. Now, not that I haven't sent emails, but um, I'm wondering, when I send an announcement, you know, I didn't realize that it was also emailing you. Um, from my perspective, I don't want to digress too much, but if I were to click on your class, what I do every day is I post announcements which from your perspective, the student perspective, should also be just announcements, right? Uh, if, you, if you are, in addition to this being posted there, getting an email, cool, right? But um, you don't have to go fishing through email. You know, you could always just, as I thought intuitively, you go to your Canvas course, click on the link, and then click on the day. Um, Anyhow, yeah, here's the PDF if you need it, down at the bottom. Yeah. I have it on my desktop, so I'm going to use that instead. All right. All right, let me get my glasses. Let me get started. Now, um, my camera is unfortunately a bit blurry, I think. And it's a cheapy uh, $60 camera, so there's not much I could do about that. But provided you have the physical copy here, all right, there shouldn't be an issue. All right. So I'm trying to print that, and we'll go through these solutions. All right, now the, the first thing is use inductive reasoning to predict the next line in a pattern. Okay. Now, 
uh, the thing about inductive reasoning is you're starting with specific examples, all right, and then you're going to form um, a general conclusion about the situation, right, a rule, theory, or what have you. Um, without overcomplicating it, let's start with looking for what's similar here. Um, this mark is probably not right, so. If you notice, one thing that is consistently true uh, from here to here, all right, is that there are sixes. So I'm going to just start with duplicating that. And then if you analyze these figures that are adjacent, all right, it goes from 1 to 10 to 100. Even if you know nothing about exponents or powers, all right, one could make a prediction that, okay, it's just a zero is building up here. So what would be three zeros? A thousand. All right. Similarly, all right, when you look at this uh, second grouping here, you notice that there are twos consistently. All right. And then as you analyze these figures, one, two, three, they seem to just be in increments of one, so it's going up one. One, two, three, logically the next one would be four. They would have parentheses as granted and everything seems to be multiplied. Even without doing the multiplication though, which you can employ mental math skills, of course. You could probably figure out what the uh, amount ought to be and just verify as an afterthought. If you analyze the non-zeros, this is 12, 24, 36. Um, assuming you know your multiplication tables of 12, you might recognize those as the multiples of 12. That's 12 times 1, 12 times 2, 12 times 3. So in following this pattern, the next one would probably be 12 times 4, which is 48. Right? And then at the same time, notice that there are increasing numbers of zeros. One zero, two zeros. Likely this would be three zeros. Right? Of the choices, that would be D. Okay? And th just to verify that this is true, 48,000. Six times a thousand is six times one with three zeros, right? So six times one is just six, and then three zeros attached is 6,000. Two times four is eight, all right? Eight times six is 48, with three zeros is 48,000, okay? It is always a shortcut. Well, I shouldn't say always, but often there is. Next, uh, draw the next figure in the pattern. Okay. Uh, what you see here is a circle, right? Even if you just uh, sort of explain it verbally, right? You have a circle, and then you have on the outside, you still have that circle, but you have a square. And then on the outside, you have a circle again. So just from this, what would you predict would be the next sort of shape on the outside? I would guess it's probably another square. Yeah. This is outside, 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 outside. So if you drew that um, on the outside, you'd have a big square. And then now inside that, from that perspective, you'd have a circle. And on the outside, inside of that, you'd have a square. And then the very innermost shape would be the original circle, which looks like a fish. All right. There you go. So this is, again, if you look at the choices, most closely resembling D. Right. Blue is a dud. Okay. Adios, blue. Estimation. Okay. Um, what did it do? It's three. Okay. Estimate the answer by rounding each number to the nearest hundred. 
All right, now, remember when you're rounding, all right, uh, you don't have to employ this personal technique of mine, but it definitely works, so I, I'm going to go with that. The place that you're rounding to is the hundreds, so I tend to underline that digit. So as, for example, in the case of 530, pardon me, 838, I would underline that place. The hundreds place is where the eight would be, this um, second eight. And then, to make a judgment about how you round, I always circle the digit immediately to its right. right. If this is four or lower, right, then you just, you know, make it zero. Right. If it is five or greater, then you change the underlying digit one number higher. Right, so if this is four or lower, you're just going to make this zero and anything after it as well. This is getting weak. Anyhow, eight based upon three would make this 800. Five based upon six would make that 600. Nine based upon six would make this one digit higher is 10, which is a two digit figure that you can't squeeze into a one digit place value. So it goes to the thousands instead. Uh, seven based upon nine is 800. And four based upon eight is 500. And since you see that you're just adding, it's 800 plus 600 plus 1,000 plus 800 plus 500. Right. In which case you should get, uh, let's see, uh, B, it looks like, 3,700. Choice B, 14, 24, 24 plus 8 is 32, 32 plus 7 is, th you know, uh, 32 plus 5 is 37, so yes, all right, with zeros. Let me see if this is a bit brighter. No, not drastically so. Okay. Come on. I know when it does that. Bear with me. Here's four. Now, I don't want to see two at the same time. I have to fight with it. Excuse me a minute. Take the thumbnail away. No, I don't want to see two at the same time. There we go. suffice. All right, number four is more uh, estimating. Estimating, you remember, is something that involves rounding, um, usually before you uh, apply the operation. Right? If they just say in instructions, I'll round to such, such and such place, that means um, do the normal operation and then round your answer. But if they say estimate, Estimating is trying to make it easier on yourself, ideally, so you're rounding the parts and then rounding before the operation. So, estimate the answer by rounding each number to the nearest hundred. Um, again, if this is 743 and this is negative 200, pardon me, minus 272, um, you round to the hundreds place, which is where the seven is. Based upon four, uh, you would make this 700. You would round down, right? You don't diminish the underlying digit. You, digit, you uh, change the digits adjacent to zeros, right? Uh, same thing here, all right? Based upon seven, you make the judgment as to keep it two or to change it to three. Because this is five or higher, it's seven. This would be 300. 
So then it's just a matter of subtracting with 7 minus 3, which is 400. All right, which is choice C in this case. Um, number five, estimate the answer by rounding the first number to the nearest hundred and the second number to the nearest thousand. All right. Now, when you are, uh, I think I had said this a while back, when you're estimating, uh, and it involves just subtraction or just addition, it's more consistent to the place value, hundreds, all right? When you're doing multiplication, you have a little bit more flexibility. Uh, and so to make it easier on yourself, you try to make the factors here, uh, 4,800, uh, 4,854 and uh, 231, um, a little bit easier by making them round numbers. So you'll notice that it deviates a little bit from the consistency. Nearest 1,000 for the 4,854 and nearest 100 for the 231. So... If this is, I'll put it in red because I think it contrasts better. 231 times 4,854. Uh, rounding, that's not going to show up. Black, okay. Rounding to the hundreds place is where the two is. So based upon three, you make the judgment call. If this digit is four or lower, and it is, you basically just change these two zeros, so it's 200. Uh, now to the thousands place where the 4 is, based upon this 8 here, if this is 5 or larger, and it is, then you change this one number higher, which is 5, and everything becomes zeros. Right? Once you do that, the advantage is that you don't have to pay attention to... Uh, anything, we really don't have to multiply anything but the non-zeros. So 2 times 5 is 10, and then you count the zeros that are left over. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and include that in your answer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now if you're going to be a good sport, and who wouldn't want to be, right? In the United States, the uh, the tendency is to put a comma after every three. At least if it's to the left of the decimal point, and it would be. So this is really one million, which is B. Strangling myself again. Should never do that. I think I need to loosen my belt too. Okay. All right. This is crushing my diaphragm. <laughs> At least when I hang over. Estimate the answer by rounding the first number to the nearest 10,000 and the second number to the nearest 100. All right. Here's division, the opposite of multiplication, which again, the, there's a little more flexibility and consistency. Um, you can, I, I probably wrote this, I figured this has been a while. I altered this to be a little bit more specific here. Nearest thousand, ten thousand, and nearest hundred. So here again for the sake of contrast, forty-three, one three zero, and three sixty-nine. Um, the nearest. 10,000 is where the 4 is, and you would make a judgment call based upon the 3 here, which again means that this would be, um, i got to write it over here for the sake of space, 40,000 only. If that's visible, but I'll try a little bit larger. I think that's a wee bit better. There you go. And the nearest hundred is where the three is, so based upon six. All right, that, because this is a five or large, it's six, you would change this digit to four, one number larger, which is four. Now, um, is it wrong 
to put the figures in the same orientation that is more or less horizontally? No, certainly not. Uh, but the, there is an advantage when you're doing division, as in this example, to sort of stack them like this. Here's the divisor, 43,130, rounded. Here, pardon me, that is the dividend. Dividend, 43,130, uh, rounded. Here is the divisor, 369, rounded as 400. If you stack them, and the ratio sort of uh, style of writing it, you could take advantage of a shortcut. And the shortcut is you could cross out pairs of zeros. One from the top, one from the bottom, one from the top, one from the bottom. And then you have this relationship instead. Four zero zero is really now 400, and the denominator is just four. And this is a little bit easier to handle, right? What's four divided by four? One. How many zeros are there? 100, two. All right, so it's D again. Okay, moving on up. There we go. Seven. Okay, in a shop that sells a variety of nuts, the prices of some items are given are as given below. If a seller buys two pounds of cashews, one pound of walnuts, and two pounds of raisins, how much did she have to pay? I'm asking for a total, essentially, not using the word total, which means that you might have to add or subtract. And in this case, you're purchasing something, so it's a bill that's going to add up a lot. Now what I would do is just take advantage of uh, the figures that you see here. It's in terms of the variety of nuts that she purchases, there's two pounds of cashews. So next to cashews, maybe put a little times two as a reminder. All right, then one pound of walnuts, all right? Uh, next to walnuts, just to account for it, you can put times one, even though that may be silly. And then two pounds of raisins. So raisins down here, this is not really a nut. I would think, but hey, um, times two, all right? And that is all that she purchased. This information about almonds and, and uh, pecans, all right, is apparently irrelevant, right? What is one dot, pardon me, what is $3.90 times one? 390. So what I would do is um, start to collimate, because you know when you add or subtract decimals, you have to sort of align them. I should say sort of, you definitely do. Lock up the place values like so. There's a little scaffolding. Um, this one, 490 for cashews. Let's figure out what 490 times two is first. Zero, 18, right? Carry the one. 2 times 4 is 8, plus 1 is 9, and there's two decimal places, so it's 980. So we have this. And one more. 310 times 2. And I'll put the work over here. 0 times 2 is 0, 2 times 1 is 2, and 3 times 2 is 6, and there's two decimal places, so you have 620. And again, they didn't really explicitly say add these, but it is understood that when you're purchasing an item, you want to figure out the total bill, and that implies adding itself. Right. So, um, everything when you add or subtract decimals has to align, right? I purposely drew the skeleton, and I would encourage you, again, if you're in the position of teacher, all right, give the kids graph paper, all right? And now it sounds kind of psychotic, right? To go, all right, Clarence, make sure that you stay within the, 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 the columns here inside the boxes, put your uh, digits. But they should, right? We really should do that, and I don't know why we don't, right? We give kids paper like this, 
right? When we're teaching them how to form their, their letters, like A and lowercase a sits in a certain uh, position on the paper, right? Then why don't we do that when we're teaching them they add or subtract, right? It's messiness, it's a sloppy handwriting that is also the reason a kid makes a mistake. And so if they're learning this when they're in eighth, pardon me, not eight, when they're about eight years old, you know, maybe third or fourth grade, something like that, second, third, or fourth, all right? Um, we need to give them some scaffolding, and that's what I'm getting at. So whether your supervisor tells you or not, uh, you know, hey, teach your kids decimals, all right? Give them graph paper, all right? And encourage them to write in the boxes. So zero is all, column eight is zero. Not, you could do this in any order because of the commutative property. Eight and two is 10. 10 plus nine is 19. Decimals line up. Carry the one, all right? One and nine is 10. Three and six is nine. So it's 19 again. So 1990, all right? What a fine year it was, all right? So that would be choice C. Go nuts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a lame joke, I know, but we're talking about nuts, all right? So go nuts. Waka waka. Definitely not have enough coffee yet. All right. In fact, I think I may take a break and take some. All right, all right. <coughs> all right let's look at number eight. Number eight is um, an electric pole is 16 feet high. Or rather, an electric pole 16 feet high casts a shadow that is 8 point feet, 8.5 feet long. This is a, a, a problem. Let me move my mouse out of the way here. This is a proportion style problem. All right, uh, and you may or may not remember, but a proportion is basically a fraction set equal to a second fraction. So. If we're talking about a fraction set equal to a fraction, that's the model shape we're going to fill in here, right? What does that mean? It means you have four voids that you have to fill in. I'm using question marks rather than A, B, C, D, or whatever. <coughs> All right. So what I do, is, uh, what I encourage people to do is that kind of try to limit the first sentence. All right, when you're filling in the parts of your fraction, uh, the first, the information from this first sentence, which I'll sort of encapsulate here, make that the first fraction, right? Then what follows it, make that the second fraction. So if it says 16 feet, let's just start with the, the numbers for right now. I'm going to put a 16 up here, all right? And then the, the second number is 8.5. So I'm going to put 8.5 here. All right. Now, before we jump the gun, um, let's analyze what those two things are measurements of. All right. So we, the one thing about this is I often tell people is that you can get away with murder in math, right? as long as you're consistent. If the top thing is an actual height, all right, then be consistent that way. All right. Make this top thing here, which is mysterious for right now, also a height. Right? It says, what is the length of the shadow, in this case they're asking for a shadow, of a 21-foot pole? 21 feet is, because a pole is normally oriented like that, it's the height without using the word. So I'm going to put 21 here in this second fraction. And they're asking for the length of the shadow, and that is in our first fraction here, 8.5, it's a ratio would be better to call it. The bottom figure is a shadow length. So again, we're being consistent. If we have established in the first one of these, shadow is the bottom, then shadow is the bottom in the second one. You may find when you're doing this that you get the same answer doing it your own way, but that could just be dumb luck, right? Just try to be strategic, right? Try to be, um, you know, consistent. There's more than one way to do it, granted, but uh, just be consistent is the, the bottom line. All right, so this is the thing that we're looking for, right? It's the one of the three, uh, it's the one out of the four voids that is unfulfilled. 
because it's going to answer the question of what is the length, right? The shadow length. And then we're going to round our answer to the nearest whole number as an afterthought. Round after, not before in this case. They didn't say estimate. When we say estimate, we are implying that you do the rounding first, right? When we just simply say round, we mean that do that as an afterthought, after the calculation. All right. Um, I need a little bit of space, so what I'm going to do is going to erase the gobbledygook here. And take advantage of the void where this scribble is. So, if I have this 16 over 8.5 is equal to 21, in algebra, there's a tendency not to use question marks or leave a, a void here. What we do is we put a letter. So, personal preference, I happen to like the letter X. So, I'm going to put X here. All right. That is the thing that we're looking for, which is standing in the void for shadow length. All right. The way that you solve a proportion is by cross products. Solve by cross multiplication. Okay, so if you multiply diagonally this way, it's 16 times x, which I'm just gonna write here abbreviated. That would be 16x. Over here, I'm gonna kinda cheat for a moment. All right? And I'm gonna write um, the cross multiplication this way is 8.5 times 21. You could enter this into your calculator or do it by hand and just simply write with the product is. No, nothing wrong with that. But I'm gonna cheat for a moment, 8.5, and simply uh, write the figures adjacent. Right. Um, this is me basically trying to be strategic. Um, if you resist the temptation to actually multiply, you, you may find that once you move the 16 over here, that um, maybe you could simplify first. It's being strategic because oftentimes you don't have a calculator. Right. Anyhow, whether you do or you don't, you, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Um, now, if we're going to solve algebraically, to solve algebraically, we perform opposite operations. All right? If these two things are being multiplied here, to justify moving 16 from where it is over to the opposite side, so that we can figure out what x is, standing in place of this question mark here, then we will do the opposite operation. What the opposite of multiplying is dividing, which is tends to be written as this line, instead of the colon with the line. Right. So the opposite of multiplying by 16 is to divide by 16. And if you did it here, your hands are tied. You have, you're obligated to do it to the entire other side. Okay. The 16s will, by design, always cancel. And that leaves you with what you're looking for, which is namely x. And now you can straighten this out, all right? You could do 8.5 times 21, hit the division symbol, and then 16, and it will spit out the answer, all right? So what should you get? Um, for the sake of time here, you should get this figure. 11.15. Six two five, whatever it is. Right. Now the second part of this is the instruction: round to the near the answer to the nearest whole number. The nearest whole number is the ones place. Right. So where's the ones place? Where this particular one is. Right. That's a whole number. Based upon the one here, you would knock all this off, and you'd say that the shadow length is about equal to eleven. Right. The unit involved here was feet, feet, feet consistently. If you had thrown the units into the problem, 
they would have been squared over here, feet squared, and they would have been still just degree one, just feet on the bottom. What I'm getting at is that if you had feet squared over feet, the justification, the way it all comes out in the wash, what would happen is that this would cancel this, right? And you'd be left with the unit that you want, right? Which is 11 feet, okay? Which is which choice? Choice D, coincidentally, right? Yeah. Oh, I'm having a hard time breathing today. I gotta get some water. Let's do number nine. Pop up and away here. These are um, increasingly more and more algebraic. Right. If you have an intuition about how to solve a word problem, that is a blessing. Don't fight it. Right. But just realize that if you need, if you're in the position, especially as a teacher, that you have to explain something to another person. Right. Number one, I guarantee. You will, all right, in the long run, understand it much better than you ever did as a student, all right. This is a this is a fact of, of educational psychology. When you teach something to another person, you absorb the material, uh, you know, eventually, much more easily, right? Because you are trying to figure out a way to explain the thing to somebody else, right? So you look for hopefully strategies to do that. I'm going to move my projector because I think it's a little off here. There we go. Um, uh, so anyhow, that's my point. My point is really that if you have an intuition, good, all right? But you have to, in order to explain something to another person and ultimately several people, you have to come up with a system. Right? It needs to be consistent. Right? That's the thing about math. It can't be wishy-washy. You, know, you have to be consistent. You, know, you do have to have a sort of mental flexibility where you can see things from different perspectives, but you have to be able to unify these. All right? All right. Anyhow, number nine. All right? Each gallon of porch and deck paint, this is a brand name, covers 150 square feet. Learn to decipher a word problem. All right? It takes a lot of practice. Right? Each gallon, that's like saying a gallon. Or if you want to be more mathy, one gallon, right? Without explicitly writing the numeral one. Covers this. Instead of saying covers, they could have said is this. So one gallon basically is equal to 150 feet squared. I'm abbreviating square feet, all right? This is what you might call a conversion factor and the lovely thing about a conversion factor is that it gives you great powers i know that this is written in the style of an equation but what you want to do when you're utilizing a conversion factor is write it as though it were a fraction right so it has a top a line and then a bottom here's what i'm getting at one gallon over 150 feet squared. And here's what I mean by it gives you enormous powers. Depending upon the rest of the problem, which I will come back to, you could change the orientation of this, meaning gallons being on the bottom and 150 being on top, at will, whatever you like, right? You have finally some freedom to do what you want. So I'm gonna just sort of encapsulate this for a moment and preserve it. And then right next to it, I'm going to write it upside down. 150 feet squared over one gallon. You may think, wow, this guy's really pulling it out of nowhere, right? Or somewhere harsh. 
Um, but it's true what I'm getting at here. If you've ever taken maybe a biology class or more than likely a chemistry class, you've heard the phrase stoichiometry thrown around, all right? In the process of your chemistry class, you probably had to convert between units, all right? Now, they don't deal with gallons really so much in chemistry, but it's the same principle. To convert from one type of unit to another type of unit, which is something that is measured, you would employ a conversion factor, whether they say that or not, right? Anyhow, they usually write things in the style of a fraction. Right? A ratio would be more appropriate to call it. And having just read this one sentence here, I know from experience that that is what I could translate it into. They didn't write the number one, they said each, all right? English is annoying, right? It truly is. They didn't say is, they said covers. But it is a, in a very subtle way implying that. Anyhow, so one is to 150. I could write it as one gallon over 150. I could write it as 150 over one. Save that. Next thing. How many gallons are needed to cover our 1,500 square feet? Here's why I'm sort of belaboring the point. A while back, when we were talking about word problems and formulas, I think I broached the subject such trouble breathing. It's making me a little dizzy. Um, I think I gave you a sheet that looks something like this. All right. I'm going to borrow this model probably several times between now and the end of this conversation. This thing down here is just an elongated version of it. It's called um, a conversion factor is the thing that I'm going to be using. And a give times conversion factor equals want kind of model, right? for lack of a better phrase. So let me write that here. Think about whatever you're given. If you choose the appropriate conversion factor, and I'm just going to abbreviate that conversion factor, uh, sort of simulating a fraction here. What is going to happen is that that is going to cause a, a cancellation effect, and that is going to give you what you want. Right. Right. Again, I'm trying to contrive a system here that would consistently work for every problem, or nearly every problem, all right, in the long run. All right. What are we given? How many gallons would cover 1,500 square feet? 1,500 square feet is what we're given. So I'm going to plop that right here. 1,500. What do I want? I want to know how many gallons. So many gallons. I'm going to put that here. So if I want to convert, this is square feet. I'll just kind of squeak it in here, feet squared. If I want to convert square feet to some mysterious amount of gallons, I'm going to choose the conversion factor that was vaguely referred to above, either in this orientation or in this orientation. And the way that I decide ultimately is by the units attached. If I want there to be strategically some kind of a cancellation effect, then I'm going to need to put feet squared in a particular place, either the bottom or the top. I'm going to draw a dot for multiplication right now and this line to separate the top and the bottom. The unit of 1,500 is feet squared. If I want that to go away, because the answer has to be in gallons, then I have to put feet squared down here. If I want gallons as an answer, then gallons has to not cancel, and therefore gallons has to be above here, which means that the orientation that I need is this which you see here. One gallon, a gallon, each gallon is equal to 150. And this is rigged to give me the answer. 
feet will cancel feet, gallons will be left over. And then the way that it works out, if you treat it like fractions, is that it's the top times the top, that is 1,500 times one, which is just 1,500, sitting on top of, this is dying here, one times 150, which is just 150, and then the unit is already established as gallons here. This you can enter into your calculator immediately, 1500 divided by 150. Or you can employ some kind of mental math shortcut. For example, again, as long as there's zeros involved here, you can get away with doing this. Cross out a pair of zeros here. The relationship of 1500 to 150 is the same relationship as 150 is to just 15. It's a little bit smaller. How many 15s can you squeeze into itself? One, how many zeros are left over? Zero. So what is the answer? It's 10 gallons. All right. If again, which is choice A, if you had an intuition about doing, getting to the answer, good, all right? Never deny a child that if they're intuition, all right? But just kind of give them a little bit of strategy because in the long run, they're gonna need that. I need the space, so I'm gonna clean this up a bit. Uh-oh. Computer went to sleep. Wake oh up! Yeah. Right, let me move this ever so slightly up. Missy and Carl work at different jobs. Missy earns sixteen, uh, pardon me, six dollars per hour. This is another conversion factor, all right. And Carl earns five dollars per hour. All right. You're translating it from English into something that is purely math, right? So if you see the word per, this means divide, which you could just have as a line like so, but instead of the colon, right? Here's per again. All right, so there's two conversions, really. We have $6 per one hour for Missy. Carl is a different conversion factor, so I'm gonna put him here. Um, and this person earns $5 per hour. All right, now as a side note, it says they each earn the same amount of money per week. Right. So, if you find when you're trying to write a, a sort of a, a skeleton uh, that of an equation, all right, don't feel bad if it starts out being more verbal and less symbolic, less mappy. All right, write what comes intuitively first, and then you can whittle it down slowly but surely. All right, if we're talking about money, I'm just gonna you know do what is intuitive to me. I'm gonna put a dollar sign. All right, the amount that they earn each week, all right, is the same. This is the mathematical symbol, symbol for sameness, equal, all right? So I'm gonna use a little subscript too. Missy's money, shall we say, is equal to Carl's money, all right? Money equals money, all right? But there are some conditions here that vary. Uncle Scrooge here. All right. Um, Carl works two hours more. Now, the, the, the way that it's being phrased is changing things to be uh, in reference to a number of hours rather than money, per se. So let's write a little side thought here, which we may introduce to this later. All right. I'm going to put a little thought balloon here. Carl works two hours more. So Carl equals Missy, shall we say, Carl hours equals Missy hours, all right, using subscripts. Two more is plus, right? So plus two is what it should be. How many hours a week does Carl work? 
ultimately what's going on here is that in a very nebulous myst mysterious confusing verbal way we are talking about two different people and two different amounts of time that they work it may be possible to just get straight to the answer right but it seems to me that because we're talking about things in reference to missy this person m we're gonna have to figure out her number of hours first all right so let's do something here and i think i may need to change the slide just to uh uh get a blank white space so i need a little bit more white area i'm gonna just minimize this and then pull up a powerpoint just because it's a nice blank area have two things that are, even though it's not specified as such, conversion factors. I don't want to use green, it's hard to see. We have a conversion factor that comes from Missy, and then we have a second conversion factor that comes from Carl. If we were just talking about them independently of one another, let's start with her. All right. If we wanted to figure out the amount of money that Missy earns right, in a week, it would come from this calculation. It would be evidently her conversion factor, which is six dollars per one hour times a number of hours that Missy works. Right. Simultaneously, if we wanted to figure out the amount of money that Carl earns in a week, it would come from this similar looking calculation it would be his conversion factor, five dollars per one hour times a certain number of hours that Carl works. Let's call this Carl hours, and we'll call this Missy hours. All right. Ultimately, all right, these amounts are going to equal because they earn the same amount in a week. All right. But what is going to be different is that Carl works two more hours apparently than her because, and, and the only reason that they would equate is because he works more than her. He ends up having to do two extra hours, this person. All right, so what we need to do is realize that these two quantities need to be refined um, the formulas involved need to be refined just a tad more, right? Again, if you start out being very verbal and you end up with something that isn't perfect on the first step, don't ever feel bad, all right? That's how it is for everybody. You slowly whittle it down to the bare essential, right? It takes time. Anyhow, these two things should equal, so I'm going to keep that. And then if I focus on the minutiae here, all right, I'm going to whittle this part, Right. Everything is being phrased in terms of this person named Missy, ultimately. All right. They're asking a question about Carl, which is changing the subject. All right. But we're going to start with that. We're going to start with, well, they're saying everything in reference to Hall. So if Carl's hours are really Missy's hours, whatever they are, plus two, I'm going to embed that information 
in here, right? Even though I still want to answer the question, how many hours did Carl work? I'm going to start with Hall. So in place of Carl's hours, I'm going to put Missy hours plus two. I'm spitting, sorry. So this becomes Missy hours times five over one hour. And on this side, and so many Missy hours times six over an hour. You will see one benefit maybe immediately, all right? The benefit is this. We still, yes, we have to answer about Carl. We'll come back to him, but we gotta figure out how many hours that Missy actually worked first. And we have all of that information pretty much uh, ready, right? I did neglect to do one thing. It's Missy plus two here. So let me put plus two squeaking in here. And just for sake of contrast, let me put this in black. Times that, okay? We have all of the information we need. And here's the benefit. We have taken an equation and we have expressed it in terms of one person only. Everything now is explicitly stated in terms of Missy's hours. No longer are they explained in terms of Carl's hours partly, right? Yeah, we're gonna come back to that, but we have everything that we need now. So again, I'm gonna keep whittling this down, right? This is sitting over one here, all right? You don't have to have it if it is a one as a denominator. If you pay attention to just what is important, this is six and M. So I'm just gonna call this six M on one side, right? Over here, I have something a little bit more complicated than just the letter M. I have essentially M, which is standing in place of Missy hours here, plus two times five. Right? And if I were going to be a better sport about it, I might just write the five in the front here. Right. So this is going to be five times M plus two. Right. That is basically boiling everything down to its bare essential. I have a letter that stands for Missy's hours. No subscripts, nothing more complicated, not being more verbose, not spelling out an entire word and an unnecessary denominator if the figure here is just one, right? So, what I can do is now this. Solve this equation here. How so? Well, if you saw that video I had made on a little bit of algebra, you have to simplify an, uh, one side before you start bringing stuff over to the opposite side. Right? So if I can't really add these things, and I really can't, I'm going to multiply, that is, apply the distributed properties, what it is, All right? to make this parentheses go away, essentially. The abbreviation for 5 times n is just to sit them, m, is to just sit them adjacent. So you have 5n, right? 5 times 2 is just 10, right? And on the opposite side, it's still 6m here. Now, if I'm going to solve for m, I need to bring the things that are m quantities together, right? When you move something over equals, you perform opposite operations in order to accomplish that. There's no sign here, but you could assume that this is a positive. So if you want to bring a positive over to the opposite side of equals, you would perform the opposite of adding, essentially, which is subtracting. Take the whole kit and caboodle, that is, take the letter and the number. So, minus 5m here, and minus 5m here. Right? Now, you might wonder, well, what happens now? There's a cancellation effect, and that is by design. This is the, the Zen balancing act of his algebra. And you might worry and go, well, geez, I don't know what m is. How can I justify canceling it? By sheer logic alone, 
right? Take comfort in that. By sheer logic alone, even something mysterious minus itself has to go away, right? Seven minus seven is equal to zero, right? Two minus two is equal to zero. X minus X, even though I don't know what it is, has to cancel. It goes to zero because it's something minus itself, right? So more complicated, 5M, so be it. It's whatever quantity, it's something minus itself. What is six minus one, uh, six minus five? It's just one M, which again is an option. You don't have to write the one if you don't want to. It's just M, all right? And then we do the calculation here. What is two plus 10? Oh, um, pardon me, there's no two here. It's just me being sloppy. It's just a 10. So M is equal to 10. What does M stand for really? This is standing in place of Missy hours, right? And this therefore is 10 hours. Now the question again was asking, how many hours does Carl work? We already have a second equation to answer that. It's Missy hours plus two. So if we just figured out that Missy works 10 hours, what is 10 plus two? 12. Carl hours is 12. Right? Word problems are like that, unfortunately. They'll kind of like steer you in one direction and then you have to head off in another first. Right? The, the bottom line is, in the long run, in the long run, try to interpret everything in terms of one variable, all right? Even if it's only temporary. That's basically what happened here. We're talking about Carl. He's a variable because we didn't know what his number of hours were. But we had to first contrive an equation that exclusively talks about Missy, using him, uh, you know, in this respect, you know, interpret it in terms of just one variable. That's the trick to this, right? Again, even if it's only temporary. There we go. All right, these will go a little bit quicker. Chapter six is where we going to be now. a little bit more plain, all right? These are the techniques I had discussed when we got to chapter six, all right? Zero in on the word is, all right? That's equals, all right? That means that everything before this is one half of the equation, and everything that occurs after this is the other half of the equation. So it says twice a number. The, the English word twice is kind of interesting because it implies both an operation, multiplication times, right? And two, the digit two. So this is two times something. If they were vaguely referring to a number, just go with it as being intuitively n, you know, the initial. So it's two times n. And a more compact way of writing that would just simply be two n and then an equal sign, right? Now remember, be consistent. If you've established n as being the variable, then continue with that. This side is a little bit more tricky because it has that counterintuitive phrase less than in it. Just beware, right? The phrase less than is counterintuitive. Which means that it is not what you expect, right? Normally a person would go, well, it implies subtraction, that is true, right? The intuitive thing would be, well, there's a 10 here, and then there's this phrase that implies subtraction. 
So shouldn't it be 10 minus something? No, right? Because it's a comparative phrase, less than, it's counterintuitive, which means that don't write it this way. It should be whatever is being referred to after it. You're gonna put minus 10 at the back. So if it's 10 minus, make it something minus 10 instead. If you don't do that, you're gonna get a negative, which is not the same answer, all right? And what follows it is three times. Times is multiplication, so it's the number, so it'd be three times n. So when, it's all, when all is said and done, you could write it concisely as 2n is equal to 3n, minus 10. They just wanted you to translate this. You didn't have to actually solve it. Which, do, which of these choices does it most closely resemble? All right, it would be they're using X's in this case, so it would be choice A. Next one, um, M, this is from section 6.4, right? Remember, we have established some models. There were at least, there's three really officially, but there's four that we gave you, right? we, the royal we. Four models that you can borrow, basically. Varies directly. The model that is varies directly is this one. Y equals K times X, right? Now they're using, um, you're gonna have to do two, uh, basically, uh, two formulas, uh, two equations here. They're gonna call the first letter not K, but M. So we're gonna just swap M in here, save K for the constant, and it varies directly as P, which means that instead of X, we're gonna use P. And then we're gonna give you actual numbers. M is 27 and then P is nine which means that you're gonna have 27 in place of M, and then the K is still here, and then nine in place of P. That is a one-step algebraic equation, so we could solve this to K right now if we wanted to, we're gonna have to, because the next part of this is find M when P is five, which you can't, can't do if you don't know what K is. So in a very subtle, vague way, all right, you're gonna have to solve this equation first. So I'm taking advantage of the little space I have. If 27 is equal to K times P, how would we solve it, pardon me? Pardon me, this is a nine right now. If we wanna solve for K first, and we really need to, the opposite of multiplying by nine is to divide by nine. And if I did it here, I must do it to both sides of equals. All right, this is the balancing act that is solving algebraically. Nine divided by nine cancels, that's on purpose. That is by design. There's the K left over. And now 27 divided by nine is what? Three, All right? It's written backwards, but it's still correct. Now that we know that, we could go back to this formula here M equals K times P, insert the value in place of K, and now put the, the particular values, P is five here, and that will figure out what M is. Find M when P is five. What's three times five? It would be 15, okay. which is choice B. These are conversion, these are procedural kind of problems from section 10.1. All right, write this as a percent. Identify what you were given to begin with. This is a decimal, right? And they're asking us to convert it to a percentage. Right. Now, again, there was a handout a while ago, so I'll just maybe I'll point to this. <coughs> Yeah, 
Here we go. Here's this diagram. All right. Whenever you convert to a percentage, whether you start with a decimal or you start with a fraction, you're multiplying by 100 ultimately. So, if you have 0 0.87, 0 0.873, and you're multiplying by 100 to accomplish this, what is the effect? Not involving the calculator, the effect is that it moves your decimal point twice to the right, which means that this is 87.3%. Alright, 87.3% is A. Now notice in the next problem they gave you a fraction. There are alternatives in this case. You could, you could if you want to. You could take this fraction and convert it to a decimal first and then convert that to a percentage. Or you could try to do it directly. Sometimes it's easier to do it directly and sometimes it's easier to do it indirectly. This is more or less direct. This is indirect. Right. I really should have curved that instead to emphasize, but I don't have a lot of space here. All right, if this is 5 eighths, 5 eighths, and ultimately, again, I'm gonna do it the direct way. If we were starting with a fraction and you're converting to a percentage, you're gonna multiply by 100 to accomplish that. Five-eighths times a hundred, all right? We'll make it a percent, however it looks, it's gonna be a percent by doing that. So, I'm just gonna disguise this to look like a fraction by sticking a one under it, all right? You could simplify diagonally here first, that is divide by a common factor, GCF would be ideal, or do that as an afterthought. Let's do five times 100, just because I think it's probably more intuitive. And you get 500, and eight times one, and you would get eight, all right? Now, this is indeed a percent, it's just ugly, all right? So make this into um, a decimal maybe at this point, because that's what the choices are, all right? Either whole numbers or percents. How do you convert an ugly looking improper fraction to um, something that doesn't look like an improper fraction? Whenever you convert a fraction to a decimal, you divide the top by the bottom. Right? The numerator by the denominator, which means 500 would go in here, and I'm gonna put some decimals. Maybe it will be a whole number, we'll see. And we'll write it here in black. Eight doesn't go into five, it's too small. But eight goes into 50 roughly six times, right? which would be 48. The difference of 50 and 48 is two, right? Eight goes into 20, roughly two times, which is 16. 20 minus 16 is four. Eight goes into 40 exactly five times, which is 40 and it terminates. So it is 500 eighths percent, or a more warm, fuzzy, friendly way of looking at it is 62.5%, which is that figure there, A. All right. I like to. I like this diagram that I made. Not to you know pat myself on the back here, because I think it's a little bit more plain. All right. As long as you're going to a percent, convince yourself you're multiplying by a hundred. If you're coming out of a percent, either way, you're dividing instead. Anything else is just gravy, All right? Now we're gonna write this percentage as a purely a decimal. All right. When you're converting from a percent to something that is purely a decimal, all right? What are you doing? You are dividing by 100 instead, all right? So if you take the figure 76, and it would start with a point here, all right? And then divide by 100, 
the effect is that it moves the decimal place twice again, bunny years, right? All right, but you move the decimal to the left instead of to the right, which means that you end up with 0.76, right? Which is choice C here, right? Now, this one is ugly on purpose. I can't help it says. Oh, green, why do you suck so bad? Okay. Um, let's see. This is a percentage. I know that it has a fraction as the number in the front of it, but all that that implies is that it is a very puny, tiny little percent. All right? Let me give you sort of a, a, a funny reference here. I have a savings account, right? With Chase Bank. Yeah, all right. Anyhow, my interest rate for my savings account is not one percent. All right, it's like point zero one percent. All right, one percent in the style of a decimal would be point zero one. Right, because the decimal would be here, and dividing by a hundred would accomplish that. All right, but if my interest rate is point zero one percent it's going to get even smaller all right all right you're going to need a jeweler's loop to look for it all right so there's going to be scoop scoop zero zero this is what i earn on my savings account not to talk you out of getting a savings account but i would go to a credit union instead all right of a bank point zero 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 one this is what they pay me in interest to having the savings account at chase bank yeah. 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 Well, this is an example of something being on that order, being really puny. All right. So, it is a fraction style, for lack of a better phrase, but it is still percentage. And if you want to convert it to something that is, since the instructions heading up here are decimal, you want to convert this to purely a decimal, rather than a percentage, you are nonetheless going to divide by 100, right? So here's what you would do. You take this figure, 3 eighths, and you divide by 100, right? Now perhaps you remember, or perhaps you don't. When you divide fractions, right, there's an instruction that you have to uh, employ. Uh, this is it in a nutshell. Keep, change, flip. All right. You keep the fraction as you see it. You change the operation to multiplication. And then you flip this, which was technically 100 over 1, to its reciprocal, which would be 1 over 100. All right. And now you're good to go. 3 times 1 is 3, 8 times 100 is 800. You could enter this into your calculator and that's the decimal right now. That is to say 3 divided by 800. Or do it by hand, which I will do. All right? Divide the top by the bottom. And I put some zeros here just to get rolling. All right. Uh, now divide one into the other. Eight hundred doesn't fit in three. Doesn't fit in thirty. Doesn't fit in three hundred, but it fits into three thousand in the same way that eight fits into thirty, which is um, about three times, and that would be twenty four hundred. And the difference between three thousand and twenty four hundred would be six hundred, right? And you bring down a zero, and you do it again, in the same way that eight goes into sixty. 800 goes into 6,000, uh, approximately seven times, which would be 5,600, and the difference is 400. And you have one more zero, and then you're done. Eight goes into 4,000 in the same way as eight goes into 40, which is exactly five, which is 4,000, and it terminates, and that's your figure, 0. 0.00375. This was a fraction of a percentage. It wasn't even a whole percent to begin with. 
And then because we're converting it to purely a decimal, it gets even tinier, all right? So this choice should be A, just like my savings account. Wah, wah. All right. Moving up, all right, on a biology test, a student got 19 questions correct, but did not pass, all right? This information that says did not pass is really irrelevant, all right? A second attempt, the student got 29 correct, uh, questions correct, all right? What was the percent of increase? There's a formula for this. Percent change is, remember, a difference divided by the original amount times 100. A difference meaning that you have to subtract two figures. All right? 29 and 19. Right? Now they're telling you that it is a percent increase, but you could have figured that out inferentially. Why? Because the second number is larger than the first number. Right? Anyhow, you would subtract 29 minus 19, and you would get indeed what? The original amount was 19. That means that the figures that you're working with are 10 over 19 times 100. If you want to treat this like fractions, make that a 1. The parentheses has become unnecessary at this point. And then it really is a matter of multiplying the top times the top, bottom times the bottom, and then simplifying after the fact. So this is going to end up being 1,000 divided by 19. Whether you do it by hand or with your calculator, what you should get is this figure. All right. You should get uh, 52.631 something. It's a little too dark in here, but... 52.63 such and such. So, 63, I'm going to put ellipses to indicate that there's something after that, and it is a percent because we multiplied. Now, they want it in the nearest whole percent, which means a ones place, if you will, from the perspective of percentages, anyhow. So, where the two is, right? Based upon six, you would round this to approximately 53% increase, right? It's an increase because this figure is positive, right? The calculation would verify that it's an increase, right? Anyhow, that is choice D. All right. The last three, the last three of these are percent equations, is what they've called collectively. Um, but you may or may not remember, they are looking for the th one of three parts in a percent equation, either what is referred to as the part, the base, or the actual percent number. All right, let me move this up a bit. All right. I love these because they're, they're a good way to, to teach somebody how to translate word problems. They're very straightforward, all right, forward. All right. when, you, when you're in the position of teacher, this is more akin to maybe like uh, middle school. All right. Teach them this when, you, when they're learning word problems. All right. It's the very first thing, at least if you have that authority. All right. Otherwise, fight for it because it's good. All right. I would. Of is times. Right. Is is equals. So the way that this would directly translate is 150% times... 390 is the thing around it, equals, right? What number? 10, you know, for a letter. This is purely arithmetic because the numbers that are involved in the calculation, that is in relation to this operation multiplication times, are right next to it. You don't have to move anything, right? The only thing that you have to do is make an adjustment on this percentage. 
probably the easiest thing to do in this case is convert this percentage to purely a decimal, which again means if you divide by 100, the effect is that the decimal point would move over two places to the left. This would really be 1.50 times 390. You can enter that straight into your calculator or we'll do the calculation by hand. And what you would end up with is 585. All right, the next one is um, one of the two that are algebraic, and it's the, maybe the more involved one. 19, right? What percentage, all right? I'm going to put that symbol there, all right? It still has those two phrases to translate. Of is times, is is equals. So in place of percentage, I'm going to put the letter P, and then the multiplication X that is adjacent, and then 115, and then the equal sign, and then 11.72. All right, now notice something in the instructions here. It says, as an afterthought, round to the nearest tenth of a percent, all right? If you're rounding to the nearest tenth of a percent, it's not estimating, all right? Estimating is rounding before the operation. Just rounding as an afterthought is rounding after the calculation, after the operation. So look at what you have. The numbers are not adjacent. They're separated by an equals. That's the left side of equals, that's the right side for all intents and purposes. This is an algebraic one step equation, which is not too hard. You just, in order to solve for P, which is to get it alone, the percentage, you move 115 over here. When you go over equals, you use opposite operations, remember. What is the opposite of multiplying? Dividing by 115, there's the cancellation effect by design. If you did it here, legally speaking, you must do it here. You can get away with murder in math as long as you're consistent. All right? When you divide these with your calculator, you type this first, divide 115. What you get is a decimal. All right? uh, what you should get is this figure. Let me write down here. For P, you get 0 0.1091 something into infinity, whatever it is. Right. Now, they want it in the style of a percentage, though. So if you're converting to a percentage, this is the, the, the not really explicitly stated second step. When you take your decimal and you convert it to a percent, you have to multiply by 100, which means, again, the effect is that you move this two spaces. Now, they also want you to round it to the nearest tenth. So if this is 10.91, whatever it is, percentage, rounding to the tenth place, tenth place is this nine here. Based upon one, you would round this to 10.9%. Right. Um, let's see. What did I do? I missed something. It's D, but for whatever reason, why did I round incorrectly? Uh, maybe I wrote the wrong numbers. I'm in the dark here. Forgive me one moment. 11, 72. Oh, there's an extra digit. Sorry. This is what happens when you write in the dark. 191. There's an extra digit here. So, all right, this is to start with 19 here. This is where the tenths place is. Tenths place is where this one is. Based upon nine, this becomes a two, sorry. Right, so 10.2%. Right, here's the last one. Let me clean this up just not to get distracted. All right. The store manager paid $110 for an item and set the selling price at $150. What was the percent markup, right to the nearest, pardon me, round to the nearest whole percent? This is another formula. Remember percent markup, all right, is basically percent change formula by another name. So to be more um, specific to markup in particular, it would be the price that the person is selling something minus what it costs them divide by the cost 
times 100. This is a final amount, this is an initial amount, and you divide by the initial amount. Initial starting, right? Initial. Okay, so we're just going to insert these figures into the formula, all right? The person paid $110. That's the cost of it, all right? So 110 would go down here and 110 would be sitting here. The selling price, what they're asking is $150 because they're trying to make a profit, all right? You subtract first because you're dividing by one figure, not several. Right. or into several, all right. All right. and then you multiply by 100. So 150 minus 110 is 40. If you have 140 over 110, you could pull tricks, pair of zeros crosses out. It's like as if you divide it by 10 without really thinking. And then you have four over 11 times 100, which means it's the same as 400 divided by 11 would be your answer. Right. 400 divided by 11 is already a percentage because you multiply by 100, which means that this would be 36.36 repeating. I'm going to put the bar over the 3 and the 6 because it would be 36, 36, 36 indefinitely. All right. And this is already a percent. So if you're going to round it to the nearest whole percent, the nearest whole percent is where this particular 6 is. It's the ones place by another name. Based upon zero, uh, pardon me, upon three, this is about 36%, which is choice B. All right. So D for 19, B for 20, and A for 18. All right. All right. And that is it. That's it, folks. All right. So again, I'm going to give you credit for this. Let me pull back the curtain here and turn this projector off. I'll tell you what I'm doing here. Come on. Light, please. Hey, the working door. Flying. Okay. Finally, need light. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you the credit for this. All right. Again, I just made this more or less as a summary. All right. I want you to do your homework. All right. Again, the deadline for the 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 the, the batch of assignments since we started two weeks ago is due later this evening, all right? So you really want to spend your time working on that, all right? Do look at this, please, as an afterthought, all right? And for, just to sort of give you an idea of where you're at. Do you understand what's going on, all right? All right, all right, and you can keep this, all right? All right, thank you for sticking with me. I'll talk to you on uh, Wednesday. Uh, no, what day is today? Tuesday, Thursday, all right? Take care and be careful.